Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you right here on the site of the World of Hunting and Nature exhibition and uh, those who are following us online. Hi there. Uh, welcome to the Stage of World Conservation Forum. My name is Miklos Chorba and I will serve as your host today. We will have truly important and fascinating topics. We will present how we lose the planet's biodiversity and how we can act against it. We will travel back to the genesis of trophy hunting. We will meet the role of bees saving the world. And we have the honor to welcome Angola, Pakistan, Uganda, and Turkmenistan. Actually, our first guests on the stage are the Turkey Council. So please welcome Dr. Janos Hovar, the ambassador of Turkmenistan, Zofia Kraus, Salim Ezer, and Aida Shonfai, who will be the moderator of the next 40 minutes. Hope you'll enjoy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are very honored to be here within the framework of the One with Nature uh, exhibition in Hungary, which is being organized at the uh, honorary level. I would like to give the speech to executive director of the representation of the Turkey Council, Mr. Dr. Jonas, Janos Hovary, to introduce himself. Thank you very much, uh, Aida. We are representing an international organization. It is called uh, Turkey Council. It is a cooperation of the Turkic-speaking uh, states. Uh, that uh, cooperation includes uh, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. And we, Hungary, are the observer country of uh, that cooperation. And uh, the whole cooperation has a secretary that general in Istanbul. That means there is a certain leading body of the Turkey Council Cooperation. And I am very honored to represent the Turkey Council Cooperation in Budapest. We have an office and uh, we are here in cooperation with various institutions in Hungary and outside of the country. And uh, we would like to have an interaction into the hunting, nature, and the cultural life of a huge nation where they're living around the 100 180 million people. Thank you very much, Aida. Thank you, Dr. Hovari. Next, I would like to ask Mr. Salim Ezer from Turksoy International Corporate, Cultural Cooperation Organization among the Turkey Council countries to present himself. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm representing the International Organization of Turkey Culture. We are a little bit more crowded than the Turkey Council. Turkey Council, are, uh, we are in, in the same umbrella, actually. Uh, we are mostly dealing with the cultural events and the cultural relations of the Turkic world. We do have, at the moment, 14 member states, uh, including the, our founding members of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Turkey. But also, we have member states, the observer members from the Russian Federation, Altai, Saha, Yakut, Tuva, and uh, also the Cyprus uh, and uh, the Gagauzia, Moldova, uh, are the observer member of our organization. Uh, we came here with the invitation of the Turkey Council, and it's an honor for us to be here in this event. Still, we are trying to figure out to find a connection to make this event richer and get a sense of what we can do for the future, for the uh, sustainable uh, and well-protected nature, what we can do with the cooperation of our member countries. And I'm delighted to, to be here with you, with all the panelists. Thank you very much for the chance. Thank you, Mr. Ezer. Uh, I should have also mentioned that Mr. Salim Ezer is the Director for Communications and International Relations at Turksoy. Next, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Uh, Kraus-Zofia to introduce herself. 
Hello, everybody. Thank you for participating in this great event. I'm an ecology scientist, a former scientist of the Danube Ipoy, Ipoy National Park, Hungary. But at the moment, I'm working in the Turkey Council Budapest Representation Office and trying to work as a science diplomat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zofia. Uh, first, uh, to start our conversation, uh, the first uh, aspect with that we would like to touch upon is the issue of hunting as we are now sitting within the premises of One With Nature hunting exhibition. So I would like to ask our uh, panels, panelists to touch upon issues of hunting, how this question is addressed and being dealt in the countries of the Turkey Council and uh, what, are the, what are the historical uh, aspects and where, where, where this question is, is, is going in the modern day context? I think uh, hunting is an uh, important element of any societies all around the world. Of course, the hunting has a huge history that the hunting in the Neolithic period was a little bit complicated, what we could do actually. That the point of view of the Turkic societies in the Turkic world, the nomadism was living together with the hunting. That uh, the nomads, the, most of the cases for them was easier. We had to get game and uh, to provide the small communities. But the nomads, in every world where they were living, they had a certain rationalism not to kill all the animals, to be cautious and to, to use, that to keep the populations in the steppe or in some region in, in the forest. It is a very important issue that the nomadism and a certain economic rationalism was living together in the classical periods of the nomadism. But you know, the world changed. The Central Asian regions, countries, tribe alliances became the part of Tsarist Russia. At the, from the beginning of the 19th century, by the end of uh, 1870, the Russian colonizers, they had a different view about the nomadism, that they, they followed a certain commercialism, that they have commercial interest, and of course, they knew there were very important, uh, very important animals, and they wanted to get uh, the lot of things from the hunting, and they started to destroy the traditional balance, which was existing between nomads and nature. And, of course, the Soviets made a few changes in the 90s, 20s, and 30s, and later even the 60s. They changed the climate, and they destroyed the geography of Central Asia and the certain part of Siberia. And it caused a lot of problems with the animals, they had to run away and they died out. And I think after the collapse of the communism, it is a great task for the Central Asian countries to remake, to, to make and, uh, and, and to handle that, this, uh, that kind of problems which were created in the in, in, in the lands, plus that's these countries 
should cope with the climate change, which has obvious impacts in this region, and the hunting in a certain way, as I see, and, uh, and the managing of the hunting is a very important element of building up a new kind of future related to this issue in Central Asia and even in Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hovari. I would like to touch upon what you mentioned in your uh, speech about traditional balance of nature. And uh, you several times mentioned the word heritage of nomadism. Um, perhaps I could ask this question uh, from Mr. Salim Azer. When, when you travel to these countries, how do, you, how do you see, how do you perceive, where are these countries in terms of the traditional balance of nature and nomadism? Even though Turkey is a member of that big, huge family, the, what we call as the Turkic world today, my first visit to Kazakhstan and then after the Kyrgyzstan was a shock for me to see that how you preserved the nature in itself and still living the, in the same conditions. Of course, the modern life has changed it a lot, but you were able to keep it as it is from those ancient times. About Turkey, I can say that we lost it a lot. The modernization, uh, we lost it a lot. And about hunting, from your question, from the perspective, and saving the nature, um, you know, in the inauguration events of this uh, festival, um, the head of the organization just mentioned it very well. There are two sides, two different opinions about hunting. One for, one pros, and one against of it. And from the, the, if we lose the natural balance in our countries, and if we cut the connection between our lives and nature, and it is a, a result that we will be against of hunting for sure. So it is very important thing to keep the balance in the nature and to keep the connection uh, from the childhood to adult life, my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Azar. And to continue within, within the same um, topic, I would like to ask Zofia about, to speak to us about the use of traditional knowledge of the nomadic people in Central Asia. I also would like to touch first the hunting, because as an ecologist, I can say that traditional hunting uh, in the nomadic people in Central Asia was a sustainable use of resources. I can bring you an example to this. According to a recent study on nomadic people in Kyrgyzstan, the principles of hunting, which were based on traditional knowledge and rules, is a successful example of sustainable consumption that can be proposed for use in modern condition to combat poverty and depletion of natural resources. The season of the year were determined not only by climatic changes, but also by changes in animal behavior. Kyrgyz hunters studied the behavior and habits of the different animals using knowledge of sustainable use of biodiversity. The Kyrgyz never hunted in May during the lambing of deer. They did not touch the mountain goats from October to March. They did not kill female animals and their offsprings. And also there was a rule that a hunter should not kill more than 100 living beings in his entire life. Um, the nomadic lifestyle of Middle Asian people in general was based on principles of harmonious and careful attitude to env environment and national use of resources. The knowledge was passed through songs, traditions, legends, which represent a set of rules for responsible consumption and restoration of natural resources. In the nomadic culture, biological resources played an important role as a source of life support. Their tradition were based on knowledge of climatic, geographical, and biological characteristics of the natural environment. That's why it's really useful to return and restore the tra traditional knowledge, which is essential tool for a sustainable development. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to also ask Mr. Doc, uh, Dr. Janos Hovari if there, are, there is anything you would like to add in terms of heritage of nomadism in addition to 
what you've mentioned in the first section of your speech. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The nomadism is not only a subject of, of historians and anthropologists uh, uh, having a certain description and understanding the structure of the previous world. That the, the nomadism in a certain area of, world, of the world that and uh, Central Asia is uh, one of the key lands of the of the nomadism was able to create a such an functional structure which was able to provide a sustainability for many centuries or maybe maybe not more than centuries, more than two, three thousand years. And of course, the other regions in, in Africa or, uh, or American, North America, the nomads, uh, they have the same role. But this area from, uh, from Xinjiang to the, through the uh, Caspian region, moving to the Black Sea region and to the Carpats, it was a huge area, it's a huge area. This is an area that was a, that, uh, that the nomadism had a logic of economism that they knew that they should keep the animals and not kill all of them, because it do do that, the next year or uh, years to come, they will have a starvation. It was a one very important issue. And the second, the nomads like to fight against each other, but when one tribe was a winner and, and the other one, the losers, joined the winners. And that's why it formed a very complicated society with a lot of languages, a lot of traditions, and all the elements they could understand each other. You Hungarians who are here, you know there is a sentence from the uh, from uh, St. Stephen, the first king of Hungary, when he recommended uh, his uh, thinking to his son, uh, Prince Imre, and there is, a, there, is a, uh, there is a sentence in his, uh, in his memory that the country which speaks only one, langu one language is weak, that it is the last nomadic element of the Hungarian history, of the Hungarian history change. But the nomadism that it was a, it was a nomadism, that they were a colorful, and it was a very structured, and the women had rights, because the women, they were important players of the nomadic societies. And uh, and uh, this uh, nomadic word, as I mentioned, is uh, coping, or the nomadic word actually, uh, which could survive the Soviet periods, it, it is challenged by the uh, global industrialization and the new, new elements from the global capitalism and moving in, into this huge area, of course, so that's uh, uh, in, in the region is necessary to have a new life. And we know there are various minerals uh, in the soil, and uh, it is necessary to open mines. And, uh, and with it, the landscape is changing. But we need in this region, and not only in Central Asia, in 
in Turkey, in Anatolia, where the villages are leaving the population. And there's a huge urbanization in Turkey. It's unbelievable urbanization. But so the, the leadership and the, and the planning of the countries uh, that they should find a solution. They should stop what they are doing, not to be protected the environmental issues enough. All the region, according to the nomadic tradition, needs and should have a new environmental policy. Thank you very much, Aida. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Salim Azer to touch upon on the same on the same topic on the heritage of nomadism. Actually, Mr. Janos' speech just uh, after that speech, I just started to question myself: like, who is the backbone of nomadism? Who who are the backbones in this? And then I might answer that question by saying that the women are the backbones of the nomadic life since from its existence, I guess, because they were taking care of the house, they were just, uh, you know, uh, protecting the area, they were taking care of about all that animals and everything. So, um, at the moment, now I'm thinking, if we needed more protection of the nature, if we need more improvement on our lives, and if we need more connection with the nature, this would be, I guess, the possible with the leadership of women, I guess. This is another whole new question for me, but I just want to mention about that as well. Thank you very much. As a woman, I'm very empowered to hear, and coming from a nomadic culture, even more so. Zofia, would you like to, anything, would you like to add anything on this topic? Uh, so the nomadic life is interwoven with the nature itself. The conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity is crucial due to overuse. The main threats to biodiversity due to unsustainable use of biological species, ecosystems, and genetic diversity are habitat loss, degradation, overexploitation of species, introduction of alien species and diseases, pollution, and climate change. The best tool to respond to all of these problems is to uh, restore the nomadic traditional lifestyle. Uh, in that tradition, which was based in the knowledge of climatic, geographical, and biological char characteristics, as I before mentioned, I can bring many examples of what tools they used to keep their life uh, with nature. They uh, used nomadic pastoralism, transhumans, uh, sustainable hunting, livestock grazing, and uh, a special cattle breeding. To touch nomadic pastoralism, which was a predominant way of life in the nomadic communities, which often described by external observers as primitive, but in fact it was a complicated economic specializ specialization in the use of pasture resources. I also have to mention another sustainable tool, tool which is transhumans, which is a mobile livestock farming method that is based on regular seasonal movements. The movements are mostly predictable. Each year, herders follow the rhythm of the seasons and pass over the same trails and pasture lands that already know. It does not evolve the movement in the entire group. The nomadism is kind of different because the entire group, the family, uh, moves together constantly with the changing of the nature. In the Kazakh tradition, for instance, there is an also an important sustainable tool for livestock grazing which involve different livestock species uh, where they use in a cert certain order to keep the cattle in extreme periods during ice, snowstorm, and blizzards. In places where the snow cover was too hard, first they use horses to allow to graze. After they ate the top on, only the top of the grass, the cattle could follow, and after them the sheep and the goats. The latter belong to the lower part of the herbs, which were left by the horses and the cattle. You can see that how important the joint cereal grazing, which ensured the animals fodder in the eyes of the snow. Also, there is, was another Kazakh tradition for cattle breeding. To avoid the loss of yang, the harsh months in nomadic Kazakhs, 
adjusted the mating time of cattle by mating different breeds. So young animals appeared in spring instead of uh, early winter uh, to keep uh, to the onset of warm and fresh pasture. Otherwise, the lambing would come uh, during winter and there would, be, would have been a loss of, great loss of young animals. Um, even their choice of shelter was sustainable. They used yurts. Yurts were beneficial to nomads because of their portability. The setup and takedown was easy as well. It was even easy to move once already erected. When they decided the patch of ground a few meters down was better spot, they easily could move. The yurt was a proven record of withstanding elements. It's endured rain, snow, wind, and extreme heat. Because of low height and circular structure, it was easy to heat up. The structure was even environmentally friendly. The materials was traditionally recyclable. And because no permanent foundation was used, there was no lasting impact on the ground when the yurt was moved. Thank you. Thank you, Zofia. In your uh, presentation, the, we all, you, I heard the word digitalization. And uh, slowly, nomadic cultures are also moving into the age of globalization. So my question, next question is, uh, we have nature, we have culture, we have nomadism. How are these countries coping in terms of keeping these different sections, but it's part of their everyday life? How are they doing in terms of keeping it together and moving and fighting the global challenges of today? Maybe Dr. Janusz Hover, you could start there. It is a very important question, the forming a new identity. The new identity, it is forming a certain way everywhere. Even Hungary is forming a new kind of identity in which traditional elements, new elements should be, uh, should be together. It is the same as I see in the Central Asian region and is the same uh, in Turkey. That uh, the both region had a different history because the Central Asians uh, were in the hand of the, uh, Russia and the Soviet Union and uh, Turkey, uh, so in the favor of Ottoman Empire, had uh, its uh, own history. And uh, actually, if I, if I talk to first to Turkey, I was living in Turkey, the Turks, uh, they were the form in the in the, in the in the twenties during the First World War, with the independence war of the country against the Antan Cordural, they were able to regain a new kind of identity, and uh, the, the new kind of national consciousness, and uh, they had to the certain way, I do not say not develop that they to. They had to adjust it to the new challenges, what is going on. That's Turkey in the 60s, in the 70s, had to, had, that it, it, it was forced by that they did it in the 80s, that the, um, the, uh, the, the gates of the country for the uh, fully privatized economy, and they had an excellent, uh, Prime Minister, later uh, President, Turgut Özal, he created a new kind of economy by the Turkey, and Turkey could be one of the most important uh, economic players of, uh, of uh, Eastern Central Europe. And uh, there's the economic opening and, and economic results changed the Turkish society, and uh, I think it is a time for the Turkish society after the urbanization, huge urbanization of the country to deal with something or deal more with the roots, the remote regions, the villages. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the lot of people from the villages who belong to the traditional uh, agricultural society. And they went into the great cities. They are in the very new world that find a certain 
intellectual linkage between the past, present, and making a certain compromise on the new issues and the old issues. In Central Asia, that they suffered a lot of with the Soviet ideas on the developments and the society building, they are free that uh, this year, the 30th anniversary of the independence of the whole Central Asian republics. Of course, they didn't have a, if the, the transition from the Soviet communism to a functionable market-oriented country was not easy. They did a great job, but meanwhile, they should find their own identity. They have their own music, their own uh, literature, they need their own traditions, and they should be proud of it. And they should find, build up that kind of institutions which could, for example, in Hungary, the Hagyományok Háza, that is a host of heritage, which is a very important brand for Europe. So what you could do with your past, with, with your culture, and um, I think it's a very important. Uh, I have met many important persons for that region, and they know it that they should do, and uh, we Hungarians, we are trying to help. Thank you very much, Aida. Thank you very much, Dr. Hovari. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Salim Azer to reflect exactly on the same topic of how nature prevention, nomadism is living in the cultures of these countries. Uh, Mr. Janos, uh, touch upon a great point. First, I would like to also congratulate that our uh, respective member countries, their independence. We are celebrating the 13th anniversary of the independence of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. Uh, as he mentioned that, they are maybe very young, but their roots are going down back to thousands and thousands of years. And if there is one thing they are good at it, all those countries are very good at the preservation of their culture. Okay, the identity need to be maybe polished, need to be maybe uh, to be more clear, but from the roots, including Turkey, um, those countries did the best to preserve what they have. About the digitalization and the modernization, I call myself a modern nomad. All we are in this time, we are all nomads actually. What nomad does, nomads are carrying news, nomads are the investors, nomads are exploring, nomads are carrying lots of things from one place to another, and it is happening for thousands and thousands of years. At this point, maybe I can ask why I am here, why our organization is here in this event, what we are doing, how this can help to make more sustainable nature, how, to, uh, how we can add on that. The core of everything is the connection. And as more as we are connecting in here, not only with the Hungarians, as you can see, there are many countries around us. We connect, we share, we learn each other, and this would eventually help for the protection of our nature, and this would help to understand us better, since we all will be discovering how one country do it and how we can get benefit through it. Uh, so I, found, I find this uh, is a very um, special opportunity to be in this event, to be part of it, and having a chance to tell about our countries, having a chance to show of our country's beauties in this very big screen, in our stand. It's a great chance, it's a great start. So the final note will be like, let's stay as nomads. Let's get the culture from it and let's share it with the others by connecting more. Thank you very much, Mr. Azar. Zofia, would you like to add something? 
Yes, I think there is a very important task that needs to be addressed, which is recovering and adapting traditional knowledge. We have really short period of time because the people who carry this traditional knowledge became less and less numerous over the years. Unfortunately, many knowledge has already been lost. Implementation of measures using traditional knowledge and values could help to solve modern problems and develop principles of sustainable nature management in the modern world that is necessary for the further evolution of human community. I propose that a database should be established and call, uh, for collecting and recovering this traditional knowledge among nomadic life and nomadic people. Uh, already a lot of factors would suggest that the mobile use of uh, natural pastures does indeed have a future. Ecologically suitable mobile pasture agriculture, for instance, by state supervised nomads, even appears to national and international agencies as a meaningful option of, for regional development. However, uh, traditional habits, local conflicts of interest, and historically developed negative stereotypes still have to tune down and overcome. Thank you very much for all the panelists, for all the issues that you've addressed in your speeches. I would like to ask if there are any questions in the, in the audience at this point. As a, uh, to use my uh, position as a moderator, then I would like to ask the uh, following question. We are representing the Turkey Council and we are representing the Turksoy, the uh, cultural organization of the Turkey Council. The question is what our organizations should do in, in terms of uh, how we can help to, to maintain, to stay, to help to be sustainable, to keep on with sustainable management, to pay attention to nature preservation, but also maintain the positive things that we have stemming from nomadism. I think, first of all, uh, we should have a uh, first-hand knowledge uh, of the countries, the certain way we have it, because uh, all of us, we were living in uh, various uh, countries, and uh, in the uh, Turkey Council, it's very important to have a good connection with the important decision makers, is very important. And after uh, to be done, what, what we could do? Of course, we are not able to do everything that we should match, I think, is very important the experts from both sides, uh, each other. We had uh, previous days a very interesting business forum, and we could match businessmen from Kyrgyzstan to the Hungarian partners and uh, Kazakh uh, business uh, uh, man uh, with his uh, Hungarian partners. We are working and the figures, the trade figures are very promising. Of course, we are dealing with the culture of the Turkey world, of course, so we are promoting a translation of many books from Turkish into Hungarian and the various Turkic languages uh, to Hungarian. We should know much more. We were very successful remembering uh, Chigis Aytavatov. He was a, he is a great writer. He is a Odysseus of, uh, of uh, that's, uh, that's, he was able to find the Odysseuses in Central Asia, and he's a Hoberos of, of Central Asia in a certain way, and uh, we published a book about uh, Aitbatov by the end of the year in Bishkek, in Kyrgyz, in the Russian, that we are trying to find uh, what we could do and translations and in Hungary we need a new generation uh, who could speak the Turkic languages. I am very pleased that there are uh, a lot of uh, lots of new students 
at the Department of the Turkology at the Budapest University. So it is our trust. We are, we are working and we are trying to identify what we should do. Yes, Mr. Azer, I'm sure Turkso has been doing and will continue to do even more. So could you please touch we upon are that? Yeah, we are doing a lot of things actually in this team because like as I said before, the common ground is the culture and the basis of the relations of human is to connect with them. So in order to connect them, we are, for example, naming a, every year a country as a cultural capital of the Turkic world. Why we do that? We are gathering artists out there. We are not having any economical purposes by doing it. The only purpose of us to connect people in those countries. The more they connect, they get better. They learn from each other. And as a result, so they can take the best uh, of their examples from, they can learn from each of them. For example, in a very small uh, town in Turkey, called Kastamonu, we declared it as a cultural capital of the Turkic world. It's a nice place with its eagles, with its all natural beauties. It has many species inside, like lots of animals. Uh, I was speaking with one young guy who came to Kastamonu from Kyrgyzstan, and he was amazed about the beauties, about the natures. And then the very next year, we brought some artists from Kastamonu to Merv, in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in Turk, Turk, Turkis, Turkmenistan. And I can say that in terms of the nature, I guess it's very well protected and very nice place. So we let them to know about those countries. The more they know about that, they are more willingly to preserve it, protect it, and make it more sustainable. In Turksoy, we work for it. We are organizing cultural events in our 14 member countries throughout the year, not just festivals. We, are, we have gatherings of artists, poets, sculptures, literature writers. We are also publishing books and helping artists to uh, perform on different states all over the world. So I guess um, even if it is limited, we are just giving them a stage to show the richness of their culture. We are also showing the common culture that we are having with those countries. And eventually, for sure, it is just creating a sense of protecting that beauty. When you discover it, when you name it, uh, then you try to protect it. This is our main purpose. Let them to discover more. Uh, thank you, Mr. Azer. If I may ask you also to touch upon the World Nomadic Games, because among us four, I think you have the experience of seeing how, how it took place. And maybe we could brief briefly mention what are the purposes of the World very, Nomadic Games. Very briefly, the World Nomadic Games just started with a, it's a big initiative of Kyrgyzstan. And also, like uh, at the moment, we are organizing it with the Turkic Council. Turksoy and some other organization in Turkey as well. We are discovering our traditional games from the beginning. You will not believe that. When I visited that, the first World Nomadic Games, okay, we are calling that the horse is the main animal of in our culture, but I didn't get on a horse. I even didn't touch a horse. For five years ago, with the Turksoy's visit, I touched first time to a horse. But I call myself, this is the main national identity of myself. And I am meeting with, it, with a horse in Kyrgyzstan. A guy just helped me to climb on it. I was in my suite again, on horse with a suite. And I wasn't know what I will do at the moment. And then it moved. I was just scared a lot. Because it was the first time thing for, in my life. It is a very bad example, but it turned out to be a good one with the help of this kind of organizations. So uh, I might invite everybody in here to this kind of events to follow our events, the Turk Soys events, Turkey Council events, and to learn about the Turkic world, which is estimately a little bit more than the Turkic Council's family. We are calling that 300 million on the world, just sharing same common culture. And let's uh, discover it, uh, have a time to discover it. I just suggest everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Azar. 
Um, I would like to close our session, and I would like to thank every single panelist, Dr. Janos Hovari, the Executive Director of the Representation Office of the Turkic Speaking, uh, of the Cooperation Council of Turkic Speaking Countries in Hungary, Mr. Salim Azer, Informations and Communications Officer of Turksoy, Ms. Zofia Kraus, the Project Manager of the Representation Office of the Turkic Council in Hungary. It's obvious that it's a big, big region, it's a big territory, and the topic is also big, so we hope to continue to talk about these issues in the future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for our presenters. Um, I hope you found useful and uh, interesting the past 40 minutes. This was the nation's hour with the Turkic Council at the World Conservation Forum. Thanks for watching.